Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Awesome. I'm here introducing the guerrilla tactics and asymmetric political activism. My name is Aja Miller, and I am an assistant editor at Stranger's Guide. We're an award-winning publication that commissions stories from local writers and photographers to build authentic portraits of a place. Learn more about what we do at, at strangersguide.com or look for our global tickets around the festival. I'm very excited to introduce our key speakers for today. Sky Wallen has spent a decade in documentary filmmaking and activism. He investigated over 20 water disasters across the US, working closely with Mark Ruffalo. Sky recently directed the documentary American Gadfly, which follows teens who ran the presidential campaign of 89-year-old Senator Mike Gravel. He is now working on a documentary series about the water contamination crisis. Marianne Williamson is a best-selling author, political activist, and spiritual thought leader. She is the author of over 14, of 14 books, four of which have been number one New York Times bestsellers. Williamson founded Project Angel Food, a nonprofit that has delivered more than 14 million meals to ill homebound patients since 1989. In 2020, she ran for the Democratic nomination for president in Sorry, in 2020. Henry McGowan is the CFO and co-founder of Gravel Institute, a nonprofit dedicated to combating conser conservative disinformation. Previously, he was the finance director for Senator Gravel's 2020 presidential campaign. He is graduating from Columbia University in 2022 with degrees in history and political science. Finally, Henry Williams was the chief of staff for Mike, Gravel 2020, Mike Gravel's 2020 presidential campaign, which he helped start. Following the campaign, Henry co-founded the Gravel Institute, a nonprofit media outfit and think tank dedicated to fighting right-wing misinformation online and crafting compelling messages for the left. Currently, he is also a student at Columbia University. Please um, engage with us with your questions on the app and join me in welcoming them to the stage. Thank you so much. I'm incredibly excited to have this group together. Um, I'm Sky Wallen. I, I directed American Gadfly, a documentary which features uh, these wonderful people. And it followed uh, the late Senator Mike Gravel, who brought us all together. And um, we're going to be celebrating his life today. And um, yeah, I. Uh, Want to get started? Um, I want to learn more about and introduce all of you to this crowd. Um, Marianne, I, I wanted to start with you. You have a really interesting past um, and an eloquence about you. Your father was a, a very interesting character in your life. Um, I want you to tell me about your experience with him as a, as a young girl. He took you to Vietnam, the Vietnam War, uh, to see what the firsthand effects of war. Um, how did you get from there to here? My father, I came home one day from school, I was in the seventh grade, and I said at dinner, I explained to my parents that my social studies teacher had said, this was in Houston, I was born and raised in Houston, that if we didn't fight in Vietnam, we would be fighting on the shores of Hawaii. That was called the domino theory. And my father stood up, God damn it! He said to my mother, get the visas, we're going to Vietnam. Those damn, that military industrial complex will not eat my children's brains. Because when I explained to him about the domino theory. So uh, we traveled internationally when I was a child. My father felt very strong about us not being parochial Americans. Uh, we were in Saigon in 1965. Uh, it was not a war zone. I mean, it was the, the heavy fighting was five miles away, but you definitely were in a place where the war is, you know, it's, um, the shooting quite hasn't started yet, but I remember he would say, uh, what are those kids? Bullet holes, daddy? Who put them there, kids? The U.S. government? God damn U.S. government, damn straight. My father was like a cross between William Kunstler and Zorba the Greek. Um, <laughs> But, but the, the point I think there is that with all the traveling we did as a child, I did learn at a very early age that people are the same everywhere. And I learned that war is a terrible thing. And I, it was in my 
bones. It was in, you know, people used to ask my father, why would you take your children on such trips? They're so young they won't even remember. And he used to say it will get under their skin. And I think it did. I think for me and for my brother and my sister, there was certain propaganda I was always invulnerable to because I knew as a very little child, that's important to get stuff in children's brains. I knew as a young child that people are the same everywhere and that war, there's no way to glamorize it. It's a terrible thing. And so that's how I got from there to here. Thank you. Um, and we have a, I want to introduce uh, Henry Williams. Uh, we have a photo, um, if we could post that. That's a baby photo of Henry. And it's a striking photo. Um, it's haunting, and it's beautifully haunting. Um, Henry, you literally seem to have been born in the ashes of 9-11. Um, tell me about this photo. Tell me about how you got from there to uh, being probably the youngest chief of staff ever to run a presidential campaign uh, with the Senator Mike Gravel. I think, Sky, I once told you that, you know, I found this feeling of living in a generation born in the shadow of political crises, living in an era after this moment in the 90s where the world seemed to come together under a single unipolar power, under a single hegemonic system. And after 9-11, the 2008 financial crisis, and I think the crisis we've all just spent the last few years living through, we all have a sense of an order that is collapsing, that is fraying at the edges. And I think one reason why I always felt immune to propaganda was my mother, who, from that photo you can see, she embedded very deeply in me a sense not to uh, believe what, you know, what, what I heard, that I should be somebody who would try to dig beneath, beneath the surfaces of things. And what always appealed to me was the idea that because we're in an era of crisis, we're also in an era of opportunity in a time where I think we're responsible to ourselves and to the future to invent a different kind of politics. I mean, the reason I raise these events is because I think we have a sense of a world and a system that failed us, of one that is constantly having its own lies and its own falsities thrown up right in front of it by events. And the problem there really is that it, we need an order based around the truth. I mean, based around what it is that we all know to be true. You know, we live in a, a political system where lies are the only currency, where dishonesty is the only currency. And so during the 2020 election, when we saw the incredible impact that candidates like Marianne were having, breaking out into the media and just saying things that other candidates weren't allowed to say because they actually, you know, were trapped by the political system that they came from. And we thought, well, what if you just had a candidate that just said the truth? <laughs> and nothing else. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. And so it was me and another friend of ours, we uh, called up retired former Senator Mike Gravel and said, what are you doing <laughs> these days? <laughs> and uh, he decided, okay, let's, let's give it a try. And so we started a presidential campaign, not to win, uh, not even really to try to win, <laughs> but only to say things that other candidates couldn't say. And in the process, we attracted a lot of attention and a lot of interest. We met wonderful people like Marianne, and I think we tried at least to widen the sense of what people felt was even possible, what it was that you could say, what you could get away with. Great, thank you. Um, and McGowan, I call Henry McGowan McGowan because there's two Henrys involved. Um, We're a package so, deal. <laughs> so McGowan, tell us about your upbringing, how you got connected with Henry and your experience uh, getting involved with, with Mike? Sure. I'd say that unlike Marianne and Henry, I was not immune to the propaganda. <laughs> um, some of my earliest memories are uh, from watching PBS on the night television when I'm five, six years old. Um, and this will date me. This was like 2005. <laughs> um, and I remember seeing the faces of US servicemen and women who died that day, that they broadcast at the end of every news hour. And as a young person, I think I was not aware that I wasn't seeing the black and brown faces that were being crushed under the boot of American empire at a rate far greater than the, the loss of lives of American soldiers. But I, I shared that similar sense that Henry described of a world of turmoil, a world that my parents couldn't make sense of for me, and, and, and neither could sort of the, the teachers in the classroom. And so um, I, I grew up in a very sort of privileged uh, elite community. I'm from Boulder, Colorado, and, and I'm lucky to say I'm the product of 
incredibly well-funded public education systems. And, and that's where I personally sort of uh, find my own roots and basis in coming to this project um, of, of radical truth-telling in the words of Mary Ann. And so uh, when I went off to college at Columbia University, I was lucky enough to meet Henry and a couple other like-minded young people on the debate team. And one, uh, one morning, <laughs> both Henry and I had overslept the, the bus that we were supposed to, to catch to go up to Brown University for a debate tournament. Overslept it many, many two hours. And um, we were lucky enough to, to have both done the same thing. <laughs> so Henry and I woke up in a, in a rush, realizing we should have caught our bus two hours beforehand, and ended up sort of having this long odyssey together to get up to, uh, to, get up to Providence. And on that, that long bus, we were able to share a conversation about a variety of things, our stances on the world. But I knew that Henry was somebody in particular that I had to stay around and that I wanted to work with going forward. And so fast forward to the end of our freshman year of college, um, there were rumbles and rumors of, of this old senator, somebody who at the time was 88, who I had never heard of, but there was a brilliant idea behind it. And that was Henry and another pal of ours, who was named David, who uh, wishes he could be here but can't, um, wanted to convince this former senator to run for president. And I think Mike is really what's important here. As much as our personal stories can help explain why we're on the stage today, um, the late Senator Mike Ravel is really the reason all of us are united and connected here today. And his personal history is one that I think you, Marianne, can really identify with and that uh, this panel I think is gonna discuss more in detail. But we came to Mike because of his radical truth-telling in the United States Senate in the 1970s. Mike, if you don't know him, uh, was famous for exposing the lies of the American military project by reading the Pentagon Papers into the congressional record, effectively declassifying military secrets about the Vietnam War uh, for the first time. And um, his willingness to challenge the political system at the cost of his own career, uh, at the cost of a, a legal court case that went to the Supreme Court, um, is something that we truly admired about him. Um, you know, he didn't care about the ramifications for his own career, about getting reelected. He just cared about telling the truth. I think it's relevant here that there's an intergenerational interface that's very interesting. The two of you come from a generation who are discovering, who were discovering, who did discover in Mike Gravel that kind of um, political hero. I come from a generation that had some of those political heroes and they were shot and killed in front of our eyes. And that very much affected those of us who are older. Um, from Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, John Kennedy, and then for my generation, in case we had not gotten the point, then they killed the kids at Kent State, which was a very definite, it was a very silent uh, but very loud message, or we will kill you too. Leave the public sector alone. Leave it to whoever it is that wants to control it so bad they're willing to kill people. Um, you can do whatever you want to do within the private sector. And most of us did, at least for a while, just go into the private sector and pretend to ourselves that there was real freedom there because we were convinced by, the, by those same powers that our freedom was you can buy the red one, you can buy the blue one, you can buy the yellow one. There's a lot of freedom here. And I think it's really beautiful watching um, people such as yourself discovering Mike with that same fire that I grew up in a generation where it was not the rarity, it was just silenced. And people used to ask us all the time, why do the kids love Mike? Why Marianne? Why Bernie? And I said, because they're still here. Mm -hmm. They're still exactly here and they're right. still fighting. They were fighting then and they're it's still It's like fighting the first now. and the third on a piano, the chord. Yeah, you're us. So Marianne, you, you talk a lot about um, the old world that's dying and the new world that's struggling to re be reborn. And I think that lends itself perfectly to the topic of today. Um, you know, I, I think there's a, a host of, of institutions that seem to be fracturing, um, whether that be media, whether that be politics, whether that be currency, potentially. Um, so explain to me what that means okay. and, uh, and, and what your role, what, what you saw as your role and your decision to run for president in that spectrum. I think we're living in two worlds simultaneously. One is the archetype of the fall of Rome. Clearly something is falling apart. These institutions are falling apart. And much of what is dying needs to die. It's dangerous though because some of what's dying we would best not have die, but much is dying that needs to die. At the same time we're living in a world where the archetype is a new world that is struggling to be born. And I think we're all learning that you know, like when I was young, there was a saying, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. 
You are either, with every breath you take, with every action you take, you are either contributing um, to the birth of this new world or contributing to the energy of the fall of Rome. And I think that the imperative at this point is that we be both death doulas and birth doulas. We need to be death doulas to that which needs to die, that it might die tenderly and as gently as possible and not violently, and birth doulas to that which is struggling to be born. That's why when people talk about a shift from a dirty economy to a clean economy, notice how people use the expression, a just transition. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to move to clean energy without considering the thousands of people whose jobs uh, rely on the old fossil fuel extraction. You can't move from a dirty economy, from a um, defense economy to a peace economy without recognizing that 51% of all jobs in the United States are at least indirectly um, uh, connected to defense. So you have to have so much love and care and tenderness in your heart that you are helping to die what needs to die more gently and helping to be born that which needs to be born. And it's been so interesting being with the Henrys and hearing what you guys have to say because I think that for me, you know, there's a saying, um, Audre Lorde said, you can't use the master's tools to tear down the master's house. That's very, very important today because the system is locked up. The political system is locked up. And if in traditional political activism, is the master's tools. All you will do is perpetuate the system. And so what's fascinating about meeting the Henrys, the people from Grutvel Institute, and I'm sure so many of you, is that we are recognizing that it's a new currency. Most, one of the reasons I love talking to younger people, why I talk at colleges a, a lot, is because people in college today are not 20th century people. They're not, they're not of the mindset. The mindset of the 21st century is different than the 20th, just like the 20th was different from the 19th. People living in the 21st century should not be living at the effect of bad ideas from the 20th century. But you can't use the political tools of the 20th century to tear down those institutions that they built. And so now it's an age of, 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 of vertical change. You know, social change does not occur on the horizontal axis. It occurs on the vertical axis. It's less about trying to convince more people and more about the radical truth telling that Henry was talking about, more about the work of what the Gravel Institute is doing where you just laid out the truth so strongly that it itself becomes a kind of resonant tool. And then, like Victor Hugo said, there is nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. The reason the old system is going to fall is because a consensus has been built by all of us, including I'm sure a lot of people here, people see how bankrupt it is between the 16, 2016 election, the 2020 election, COVID and Ukraine. People recognize the bankruptcy of the system. People are beginning to connect the dots. And I think that we in our own way are being led to just lay down the truth in a way that's going to burst forth in a new kind of political power, a new kind of political activism, and a new kind of political possibility, simply because we will no longer have it. And that is always why. The majority of people did not wake up and say, let's end slavery. The majority of people did not wake up and say, let's give women the right to vote. The majority of people did not wake up and say, let's desegregate the South. It doesn't take a majority. It takes a critical mass who simply gets to the point with enough fierceness and enough confidence and enough courage to say, in whatever way we say it, hopefully elegantly, hopefully nonviolent, well, definitely nonviolently, and hopefully in a very sophisticated way, that shit's got to stop. And that's what's happening right now. And so, uh, Henry's, you see this fracture, I mean, I think the photo that we saw, you know, the, of the towers, it's, for me, symbolically shows the, the crumbling of the institutions. Where, where do you guys see yourselves, uh, your role in your work with the Gravel Institute, your work on the campaign, your work moving forward? You know, uh, what was your strategy in the campaign and what did you learn from the campaign yeah. and what are we gonna do next? I wanna take what Marianne talked about, which is the idea of social change as being about a critical mass. You know, I think the thing that you get in growing up in the 21st century is a sense of the world as being small and close together. The sense that everything that happens is right there 
to reach out and touch. And for me, I had that experience of, of being right there with my mother, who was walking home from daycare, and a photojournalist snapped her with the buildings falling in the background. And the thing about that photo is that it's circulated online, right? It's made its way out there. It really, for me, the internet has been the singular influence. I mean, in my generation, we didn't have to fly to Vietnam to see the footage, to see, for example, the footage of Mike Gravel speaking on the 2008 debate stage. And there he is. He's the conscience of a nation and the conscience of a people standing up there with Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Joe Biden, the people who would lead that party for the next 15 years through today, and telling the truth, and saying something about the Iraq war that at that time, nobody wanted to say. It was all about how we're gonna fight the war smarter, how we're gonna win, how we're gonna surge troops there, and we're gonna do it right this time. And of course we know how that one turned out. And there was Mike Gravel, before it all, telling us that, and telling us, kind of like the grandfather to the nation, the lessons that we needed to hear, the truth that we needed to hear. And there are the scions of the political establishment laughing at him cackling at him and mocking him. And he was demoralized, deeply demoralized, by his experience running in 2008. But the jur here's the journalists as well. And journalists, and, but here's the incredible fact. That clip has now been viewed a couple of dozens of millions of times since then, mostly by people like me who were seven, eight years old at the time that that debate first happened, right? You know, the thing about the internet is this stuff doesn't go away. It keeps recurring, and when it's relevant, historically relevant, when it speaks to your moment, it comes back up again. And so for us, our experience of being radicalized, our experience of being exposed to these truths came from the fact that the internet brings it all right up in your face. And by that same token, since we were educated that way, we had this sense, well, what if you did that in reverse? What if you use the internet to put those messages back out there? And the idea was looking at the 2020 campaign, it was spring of 2019, and you had people like Andrew Yang, Marianne Williamson, Pete Buttigieg, who had stomped onto the political scene and because of a combination of media, social media, the internet, became major national figures whose words had to be listened to about politics. And it was because every single journalist in the world is on Twitter, and if it's on Twitter, they think it's real. <laughs> and if they think it's real, then they make it real. They talk about it, they report on it. And so we felt there was a flattening of the world, you know, a drawing closer of everything, and that you could just reach out and touch it. And, I mean, plenty of people are on social media every single day trying to get famous, trying to make it big, right? The theory, though, was what if you take somebody who's not going to be president, someone who doesn't even really want to be president, who's retired, who's 88 years old, and you had them come up and just say the truth, the same truth that they had been telling for over 50 years since the high watermark of Vietnam. I mean, Mike Gravel was the very first American presidential candidate to endorse gay marriage, and he endorsed it back in 1975. He was the only person in the entire Senate to even pass, even, even propose a resolution in favor of gay rights in 1975. The thing about Mike was that he persisted that whole time, and he did so in the wilderness. He did so with no allies and few friends, and the thing is, people in my generation came back and discovered him. And we pulled him up and said, listen, what you said then is what we say now. And we put him out there and it blew up. I mean, people were amazed by it. They thought, this guy is here, he's real, and he's been here all this time. Why wasn't I taught about him in, in history class? Why didn't nobody tell me that there were people who were right all along? And I think that discovery, personally, seeing those videos, that was the discovery I made, and I had this sense, we need the world to see this. And I think our project today is that same sort of thing. You know, you bring in information, you see the world, it's at your fingertips, and you try to tell the truth. And if you do that and you succeed at it, it survives. I mean, Mike had this one brave act, and he once told me, he said, one brave act can make a lifetime, you know? One act of truth-telling survives. I mean, we all talk about Socrates, a man who never wrote anything down, who never did anything else but talk, but he told the truth, and so humankind has not forgotten about it. Yeah, and um, so talking about guerrilla tactics, uh, when, I, when I originally wrote the, the title of the panel, I think it was Unconventional Tactics, and Williams, you, you said guerrilla tactics. So. Um, Mike, I feel like, I don't know if he realized, but he was kind of ahead of his time uh, with his rock video, right? So, uh, can so we can see kind of, yeah. so we can talk about that, but how did the guerrilla tactics evolve right, in 2020? Right. I don't want to dwell on the past. So how are the guerrilla tactics going to evolve, and, and, and what are you guys doing now and in the future? 
Let me just tell one, one small story about Mike yeah. just because I can't help myself. Please. When he first ran for Senate, he came out of college. He was broke, and he thought, I really care about fighting the Vietnam War, and I really care about politics, and, and I really think that America needs to change its role in the world. And he said, well, maybe I'll go to Massachusetts. Well, there's too many Kennedys there. And there's two new states coming into the Union at the time, New Mexico and Alaska, and he flips a coin and decides on Alaska. <laughs> He ends up there as a railway brake man, and eight years later, he's Speaker of the Alaska House. And one year later, he's the second ever senator from Alaska. The now, the, and he, right, right. Well, and the, and the way that he, he made it there was he came up with this idea to make an infomercial about himself called Man for Alaska, where he you went to every neighborhood. Yeah. Go watch it on YouTube. It's incredible. It's on YouTube. Sky put it there. Uh, yeah. And it's one it's of the brilliant. most incredible acts of political media I've ever seen. I mean, this is, you're talking about the 1960s, and he's flying around to villages to project it on the walls and on the sides of hills to show people, this is who I am, and this is what I want for this land that has only just organized itself politically. And when he made it to Congress, he was approached by Daniel Ellsberg, who was an analyst at the RAND Corporation, who had been working on a report about the Vietnam War, and he said, the people need to hear this, the people need to see this. And so Mike was a political technician. He was not an unsavvy guy. He knew how to use media, he knew how to use cutting edge media. And when he ran in 2008, he was the very first candidate with a Twitter account, and the very first one to be on YouTube. And he ran a cutting edge campaign before, he was almost too early, actually. It didn't, <laughs> he, was, he was a little too quick uh, to make it to new technology, and I think, that's the other side of Mike, as a political innovator and as somebody who I think embodies the spirit of what we try to do today. So I think that's, that's the lesson we take from him in, in our work. It's really important that everyone understand Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers exposed the lie about the Vietnam War. The publication of the, of the uh, Pentagon Papers was the beginning of the end for the Vietnam War. And, that, and when Mike Gravel, Senator Gravel, actually sat as a U.S. Senator and read the Pentagon Papers into the congressional record, it was such a symbol that that information will be seen here. And I don't think the moment should go by. One of the great guerrilla artists of our time, who in Daniel Ellsberg's words it did even more than I did, is Julian Assange, who today is wasting away in a prison for doing the same thing thing that Daniel Ellsberg did, but when Daniel Ellsberg did what he did, there was a brave U.S. Senator who would acknowledge the importance as opposed to the cowardly U.S. Senators today who won't even mention the words, let us mention them here, mm -hmm. free mm -hmm. Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. yep. <clears throat> you know, I think the sense that our institutions are in peril is in no way new. In Walt Whitman's 1871 sweeping text, Democratic Vistas, he wrote that democracy itself is still untried. And well, why was that? It was because people did not have the conditions to come forth in public to engage in robust discussion and debate without fear of humiliation, without fear of domination. And I think that the internet is really what opened our eyes, at least to our generation, um, of the opportunity and ability to engage in public discussion and debate without that same fear of humiliation and domination because you might not have to identify as yourself. You can be a completely random account or maybe you can be an 88-year-old senator who all of a sudden has a Twitter account run by a couple of 18-year-olds. But the internet's ability to, to level the playing field in that sense to, to open up discussion and debate I think is what primes it for being um, a context or a platform to, to use guerrilla tactics. And for us what that meant was posting memes on a Twitter account for a senator who people hadn't thought of in 10 years. And that struck a chord with, with people both our generation and, and people much, much older. And I think that when we finished our campaign, and, and very sadly we ended up qualifying Mike for the Democratic National Debates, and Tom Perez at the DNC um, refused to put us on stage next to Mary Ann, next to Andrew Yang, next to a variety of candidates who had a fraction of the amount of original, uh, unique support, unique donors that Mike Gravel had. Um, we turned to ourselves and, and we had to ask sort of what was next. And, and from the very start, Mike, the, the one thing that Mike asked of us, he said, you know, I'm at the end of my life and you guys are at the start of your lives. And the one thing that I care about is that when this campaign inevitably ends, because as an 88-year-old eight, eight and a couple of 18-year-olds, we're not going to win, all I care about is that you keep fighting for these same issues. And so when we looked at the internet, however much opportunity existed there and how much success we'd been able to find on Twitter, we also acknowledge that 
largely it was a, a platform or a canvas that had been captured by conservative disinformation, by propaganda. That same propaganda um, from the military industrial complex, for example, that I had seen on PBS, but it's taken a new form now on today's internet. And something that we identified as a stand in for this is a group called PragerU. Does, have you guys heard of PragerU here before? If you haven't, it's, it's rather disgusting. But this is an institution funded by oil and gas businesses, petrochemical companies. And they pretend to be a charity. And in fact, they pretend to be a university, PragerU. And what they do is they make these short, innocuous YouTube videos that have animations and a presenter. They look official. They look like they could be from a university. And what they tell you is that, well, fossil fuels, they're actually the greenest energy source. Um, and, and the propaganda goes much, much farther. But we identified um, a problem on YouTube specifically, but all across the internet, of, uh, of conservative money capturing um, audiences at a, at a very alarming rate who are incredibly young. Because that same post 9-11 world that Henry and I grew up in is, is a world of YouTube. You know, I, I credit my success to public education, but I've done a lot of my learning, even as a student at an elite university. I probably have learned more from YouTube than many of my professors. Um, and the problem there is that young people are finding this disinformation, and they think it's legitimate, they think it's real, they think it's, it might even be radical truth-telling, because it's, it's not coming from a, a mainstream media source, it comes from this independent YouTube channel you think you can trust. Um, but we knew that something had to be done, and we knew that we had to address it, because it was the language that we spoke, um, a language of YouTube, of the internet, of Twitter, and sort of capturing the, those same guerrilla tactics from the campaign and trying to apply them to a completely new platform, to a new type of education, is a challenge that we're still trying to face today. And I think that's something like Marianne's uh, candidacy can really inform us on. Um, and, and so moving forward, I think something that I would love to hear from you about, Marianne, is communicating online and, and finding new audiences online is much different than speaking at South by Southwest or at universities. And I wonder how you have found community and opportunity there as somebody both as a presidential candidate and as an activist. Well, you know, it's interesting because a couple of minutes ago you said something about the anonymity of online, and you said that you don't have to expose yourself to so much derision and humiliation. Well, I think that we're not going to get to where we need to go until enough of us are willing to expose ourselves to humiliation and derision. I think that the, um, the online uh, universe certainly has a huge part to play in all this, and I don't think anyone does it better than you guys. And if you have not seen the Gravel Institute videos, then you definitely want to. I think it's, it's incredible. But I think that this is a, you know, it's interesting about guerrilla tactics. Let's go back to the American Revolution. So the American Revolution, one of the reasons the colonists won is because the, um, it was the 18th century, but the British were still fighting a 17th century war. So the, the Redcoats were in a line waiting for someone to say, commence fire, right? And the, the um, American colonists, partly because of their exposure to Native Americans, were behind trees. They were the original, they were guerrilla, they were behind trees, they were running around, right? So the guerrilla tactics are not the old activism like we talked about, it's everybody getting behind the tree that they need to get behind. So some people uh, are being, as these guys are, in the best way, they're feeling assignment, just like cells in the body are assigned. You go to the pancreas, you go to the blood, you go to the brain, you go to the online space, um, you go to education, you go to whatever the issue is. But you can't, um, you, you can never overestimate the importance of someone who is willing to get up there and say it. Let them laugh. That's what I learned from my experience. And that's what Mike Gravel, that's what Mike Gravel learned. You know, when you just said, Henry, that after his experience in the 08 campaign that he was demoralized, it's so interesting. He was demoralized by that moment. I was inspired by that moment. So were we. And I'm so glad that you guys gave him the opportunity to recognize how important it was to so many people. There are people in this room, I don't think we're saying anything in this room today that everybody here doesn't know. Like, I, we, this is not the era of data collection anymore. People aren't like figuring it out. 
People get what's happened. People understand that our government has been taken over by a corporatocracy. We understand that the corporate overlords of uh, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, big ag, big tech, big um, chemical companies, fossil fuel companies, and uh, the military industrial complex holds hostage our government, therefore has squeezing the well-being out of the vast majority of American people, and if we don't stop it, it will only get worse. Everybody gets that now. The issue now is what is each of us feeling called to do? And when you said what, you know, what your question to me is each and every person, like every cell in the body has a natural intelligence, right? You, like you go to where you go, to what organ you go to, you are led in the highest life of the cell in the body. It collaborates with other cells to serve the healthy function of the organ and the organism. The body survives because the body can take a lot of hit. The body can take a lot of assault and injury as long as there is a healthy immune system. That's how we have to see ourselves in relation to the woundedness of American democracy and our, our civilization. You're an immune cell. And just as the cells in the body are led in a natural intelligence, each and every one of us. And I think each and every person here feels it to some extent. You're not going to get your... your your instruction for what you do as a guerrilla activist from someone else. Spirit's not going to tell me what you're supposed to do. Spirit's not going to tell you what I'm supposed to do. But each of us can wake up every morning doing that which my gut tells me I'm supposed to do is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do it knowing that millions of other people waking up in this morning registering democracy is in trouble, democracy is in trouble, the planet's in trouble. And it's not going to come from some top-down organizational structure. That's why meditation matters. That's why mindfulness matters. That's why prayer matters. It's that we're all being, you wake up in the morning, you pray, you meditate, and then you're really, to really able to kick ass in the afternoon. Because you ground yourself in something deeper. And to me, that's the ultimate gorilla. It's that you know because of the grounding in something which is a kind of higher intelligence, however you describe it, and each and every one of us is taking our part. And I also think that we recognize each other. Just like the cells in the body, they, they, they move to collaborate with each other. A malignancy is when a cell disconnects from that natural intelligence, disconnects from that collaborative functioning. And the problem with the human race is that we've been we've been infected by the malignant consciousness that it's all about me. Once you convert from it's all about me and me getting the money I want, me having the career I want, me having the prestige I want, once you evolve beyond all that, it's me serving the ages. Here, here I am, use me like the gospel song. Use my hands, use my feet, use my failures, use my successes, use my talents, use my skills. What do you want me to do? You say to whatever you name that force within yourself. And then you find yourself meeting people who are, you're doing this, and you're doing this, and you're doing this, and you're doing this, and uh, we'll all party later because we will have the experience one day of knowing that shit worked. That's what worked. That's what I believe is the gorilla of this moment, the gorilla zeitgeist of this moment. It's, it's a quality of our personhood that we're all waking up to knowing I'm supposed to do this. It's like in, the, in that wonderful book, Letters from a Young Poet, Letters to a Young Poet by Rilke. He said, only write if you have to write. I think there's something in each and every one of us, I have to do this. Whatever it is in you that you feel, I have to do this, and then your brain is telling you, I shouldn't do it, or your parents are telling you, I shouldn't do it, or your friends are telling you, I shouldn't do it, but something in you says, I have to do it, that's what you should do. And to me, that's the ultimate guerrilla activism. Yeah, Mikey. I was just going to say, Mikey used almost exactly the same phrase. He said, use my hands. He said, use my image. Use my legend. Use me as a symbol because I'm more powerful that way. And he said, that way I never really die. That way I never really pass away because so long as there are people who hold me together, hold me as a spiritual force in this world. I mean, as someone who can continue to act on us, act through us long, long after he's gone. So all these cells that are struggling to, be, to birth a new world. The immune cells. The immune cells. So my question is, you know, I see, I see t tons of magical, you know, a plethora of magical efforts, whether they be artists or activists or new media journalists, um, you know, making their mark. My question is, you know, some of it is advocacy and some of it is organization. 
what is the difference between advocacy and organization, and how do we affect, because I feel like we, we're not going to make effective change without effective organization, perhaps different cells in the body working together when they may not have in the past. So, you know, how... But that's the beauty of this moment, because some people in this room are good at organizing. Some people in this room are good at the activism. Some people in this room are good at the online. Some people in this room, everybody has their, it, it, it's, it's like the cells on the body. There's an ecosystem here. It's just, we've been thrown off our natural intelligence. But when you return to your natural intelligence, whether you do it through a spiritual or a secular perspective, but it always includes a deeper quieting of the mind so that you can move into the chaos knowing how not to be at the effect of the chaos, but to be on top of the chaos and a transformer of the chaos. Remember, this is chaos that's about, it's turning into this Kairos moment of possibility. And so how do they all fit together? It's just like the cells in the body. Nature knows how to organize itself. You will meet, it will happen. You'll be at South by Southwest. You'll meet somebody. You'll end up meeting a person that you met there. There's a higher intelligence, and well, it's not even a higher intelligence than the intelligence of this world. This world now is dominated by a lower intelligence. And people are moving into a space of higher intelligence and finding out how it fits together. Finding ourselves meeting each other and isn't that interesting and blah, blah, blah. Everybody knows this because it's our experience. And to maybe extend Marianne's metaphor even further, I think there's a power to signaling. I mean, there's a power to uh, when you stand up and when you do an act of truth. The power of that is that it goes beyond time. It's not just of its moment. It's for the ages. It's for all time. And so I guess to some extent how we organize and how we all come together is that those figures and those moments appear and we all recognize them. And in recognizing them, we come together behind them. And when figures appear, I think like Mike and like Mary Ann, we all sense it. I mean, we can all in this room, I think, feel it. <laughs> what you get is a sense that it really is possible for us all to see something in each other and in ourselves that is deeply connected. And I think, again, it really isn't at the level of... Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be for you at the level of, of explicit spirituality. I really think it's about devoting yourself to a purpose that extends beyond your own lifetime, beyond your own interests, your career, beyond the things that benefit you in the here and now. It's a sense of connection to this great chain of being, to the past and the future of all of us, and our sense of responsibility to it. And when you feel connected to that in a deep way, it does drive your actions. It does shape what you do. And when you meet other people who feel the same way, you recognize implicitly and intuitively that you already are on the same side. And you know, ultimately, when you affect a spiritual revolution in people, suddenly all at once they realize they already were all connected to begin with. I mean, it's not that you're connecting them, you're just showing them what they already have inside them. And of course, this is why we're such great fans of Marianne. <laughs> well, when you were talking about asymmetrical, asymmetrical means nonlinear. It's not, it's not linear. It's, that's why we were talking earlier about the laws of physics have more to teach us than the laws of traditional political activism. It's that when you have a certain level of thought that goes deep enough, you're serving the ages, you're not just serving yourself. You're serving your ancestors and your descendants. You're not just serving the people that have to, you, the world would tell you, would give you permission you are affecting, according to the laws of physics and spirituality, which are basically the same laws, that there are people thousands of miles away who are being emboldened. Or Mike Ravel. Mike Ravel was speaking with such power that it attracted you guys on some deep level that you, you know, what, what does he need? It's kind of like the fairy godmother. What did she need? She needed a ball gown. What do you need? Well, there are these teenagers. <laughs> Well, and I think that, you know, on a, on a, on a deep level, it's the, it's the thing that you need to chase out. I mean, you need to look inwardly to find what you need to do outwardly. I mean, you need to find it in yourself and then, and then find it. But really on a, on a deeper level, and I think on a practical level, coming out there in a world of lies and telling the truth, it turns you into more than just a person. I mean, it turns you into, into a, a vessel, into a radical and a vessel and a symbol for ideas bigger than yourself. And that's why you take people like Marianne and like Mike and like Bernie, we put in them our hopes and our dreams because they show us that we're capable of it in the first place. They show us there's something inside us that can really get it done and change the world. And I think that 
we all know that the last five years have changed everything. I think in some sense, what Marianne will often say, we know it. We know it in our bones and, and we need to start acting. We need to start uh, taking it somewhere. And I think also just the question of a spiritual crisis. And I don't mean it at the level of explicit religion. I mean that we all struggle to connect ourselves to a greater purpose, to a meaning and an intention. And when we do that, when we can do that, uh, suddenly we can change everything. Uh, change everything not by using the old tools, not by using the old methods, but simply because when you get out in public and you tell the truth, people notice. And if you want to be David and beat Goliath, you have to use a sling. I mean, you have to find another way. And that's been what I think both the internet has made possible, what new technology has made possible. But beyond that, what our emptiness has made possible because we feel empty, we feel disconnected from the world. If someone can come along and offer us a connection to a higher purpose, it can change our lives and change everything. And so it's really an era of crisis, but also opportunity. Yeah, but this, you know, I come from a generation, you're very kind to people who are already out there. But the zeitgeist of this moment, this is not a revolution just led by soloists. If the revolution is just led by soloists, the system knows how to get rid of the soloist. This has got to be a situation that's led by the choir. Each and every one of us has to think of ourselves as, is, as um, singing our own notes. Each and every one of us. I think if, if you think about what brought you to South by Southwest, you know, this, the era of data collection is over. You don't come to something like this week anymore to so much learn something you didn't already know. You learn to experience more deeply the things which by now we all already know. And the power isn't just what happens out South by Southwest, it's a time release capsule. The, the hope is that you will leave here more capable of standing on the ground that you already, you already almost did, you already had a sense of, or you wouldn't have come here to begin with. Doesn't that make sense? We, we, it's the quality of our personhood at this point. The quality of our personhood. And I think... Um, it, it's not just, I mean, when you see people who are older, by definition, people who are older, a few steps ahead, just in time. But the call is going out to all of us equally. I think the older we are, the more we know certain things. The younger we are, the more we know certain other things. If you're older, you know the myth of the eternal return, those things which keep happening in cycles. But if you're younger, you're more hip to what's happening now. So wherever we are, whoever we are, we really have an equal part to play in all this. Yeah, every time I hear you all speak, I, I never come out of a conversation. I'm going to re reiterate, reiterate what Dave Weigel from the WAPO said. Uh, he never gets out of a conversation with, with you uh, cynical. Um, a lot of people are scared. A lot of people are cynical. Can you speak to them for a minute about, you know, uh, just on a human level, how to keep going. I will. Cynicism is just an excuse for not helping. I'm so tired of it. I'm so tired of it. These people who say, I'm so traumatized by what's happening. Do you think the people walking across the bridge at Selma were not traumatized? Do you think, do you think the women suffragettes who were thrown into, uh, thrown into prison uh, for having the audacity to march for women's suffrage. And the conditions in the, in the prisons were so awful that they went on hunger strike. The response of the prison officials was to send men into their cells, force these metal contraptions onto their necks and force feed them. You think they weren't a little bit anxious? You think they weren't traumatized? We, we, uh, this is why Ameri people all over the world look at Americans and think, what are you people thinking? What are you people thinking? Get over yourselves. Yes, this is a difficult time in our history. It is. It's a difficult time. And I feel for younger people because I'm from a generation where I can't say we didn't get to party. But then on the other hand, there had been generations before us that had us tough. We had abolition, but then we had abolitionists. We had the institutional suppression of women, but then we had the women's suffragette movement. We had segregation, and then we had the civil rights movement. We're not going through anything other generations have not gone through. These, these, these forces, 
Remember, out of 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 41 of them were slave owners. We have always been both. We have always been the dreamers and the forces which would kill the dream. But we are not only the heirs of the problems, we are heirs of the problem solvers. Can we get more graceful and toughen up, please? Let's not be the first generation to wimp out on doing what it takes to push back on those forces. We all have our cynical moments. We all cry. We all go through what we go through. It's difficult. It's tough. But, you know, I'll just tell a real quick story and I'll stop. I, I, I sold a book. Oprah had me on. It made all this money. I did what you do if you're in Los Angeles and you sell a book and it sells. You buy a house in Montecito. And I bought a house in Montecito and it was my first day and I was on my beautiful Obasan rug, on my beautiful couch, looking out at my beautiful swimming pool and I heard my father's voice. The bastards got to you, didn't they, little sister? <laughs> Just don't get sucked in. Don't get sucked in. See yourself as a transformer. Yes, they're going to mock you. Yes, they're going to humiliate you. Who cares? They, they, they executed 81 people in Saudi Arabia the other day, in a, the largest mass execution in the history of that country. Some of those people were executed for quote unquote deviant views. We're a bunch of privileged Americans. By definition, if you can even be in this room, this is not the moment for us to indulge our cynicism, our frustration, our anger, or any of that. It is time for us to stand up as the men and women that we know we're capable of being and to kick ass for the sake of our country. That's what it's yeah. about. Yeah. And I think uh, we're going to transition to uh, audience questions, but I think uh, Mike Gravel would uh, completely agree with you, who never got cynical to his last moments, uh, and who saw so much... Uh, so many of his fights were lost, or weren't won in his time, yet he kept going. So I think, uh, you know, bringing it back to him, uh, you know, I think he can, I hope, if you haven't heard of Mike Gravel, you, you should check him out, because he's, he can be quite an insp inspiration uh, to many people. So I'd, I'd say there's yeah. one other, I think, essential lesson from Mike, and it also, I think you, you find it in Marianne, you find it in us, you have to have a sense of humor about it, too. I mean, you have to be able to laugh. Yeah. You have to be able to laugh. And I think this is the escape from cynicism, too. I mean, the world is, on a dark and on a deep level, very funny. <laughs> and it's something you have to be able to stare down and, and look directly in the eye. And I think there's a deep instinct to shy away, you know, to move away from the hard truths. But the thing Mike did to stare unflinchingly at the world for 50 years and never blink was to laugh at it, was to laugh at his own situation and laugh at himself and always stay aware that there were things in this world he did not know and did not understand and that maybe if two 18-year-old college students called him and said, maybe you would succeed if you ran for president again, he says, well, why not? I mean, that was, I think, the approach he took to just about everything. Well, he said you have to ask his wife first. He said he had to ask his wife first. <laughs> uh, I talked about, and I think, him here, you, know, you talk. I just want to say, you and I talked about not taking yourself seriously. We can't take ourselves seriously because the world is so serious right now. You serve the world, the seriousness of the world best at this time by not taking yourself too seriously. You hold yourself light because we have to have all those synapses going and sometimes being light and being loving and having fun and that's part of what opens up your mind and your heart to being as effective as you can be. Um. I'm going to switch to audience questions. Uh, we have a few. So um, how do you sort through today's news, which seems to have so much propaganda on all sides? Don't get cynical. <laughs> and be willing to read at people who you disagree with. I think that's something I found um, increasingly true in today's world, is that I have to be able to expose myself to the viewpoints of of those of the Prager use of the world, the people who I know are corrupt and biased, but are saying something for some reason, and, and just putting being willing to expose yourself in that way is essential. So, you know, I don't think you're even going to be able to recognize the propaganda that your own side is telling you if you don't take the chance to look at the other side. Yeah, you know, I think there's another part of it, which is that you know if you connect yourself up to this greater human purpose, I mean, if you connect yourself to others and you constantly bring it back to the human place, to the sense that we are together and that we have a project 
Uh, these things, they come and go. I mean, they'll pass over you and you'll get it wrong, plenty. It's happened to all of us. I think the critical thing is that you're aware of what really underlies it all and what the point of it really all is. And the other thing to be aware of is, is like Marianne said, because the world is serious, it demands something of us. I mean, we have to take ourselves not so seriously to deal with it, but we also have to take the world and these events very seriously. And we have to be willing to be wrong and to grapple with them and to see past appearances. And I think this is one of the other lessons of Mike, as he was someone who was always reading, always learning, always changing and always willing to find something new in everyone he met, that he would talk to young people constantly. I mean, I will tell you, he had more teenage friends than any other 89-year-old on this earth. <laughs> there was no one who was at his age who was so willing to listen and to learn and to be wrong. I mean, Mike was somebody who was still changing his views on things in his late 80s, and that is a very, and an unfortunately rare characteristic, and I think something that we all have to take deeply to heart, that we're going to continue to connect, connect new, anew with new people throughout the rest of our lives and never change. And I mean, if he could stay that active and mobile and all changing at 89, I mean, what excuse do any of us have? Uh, um, you know, there was a question that disappeared, but uh, I think I remember it. Um, what did these campaign, I mean, Mike, Mike had many costs to things that he did uh, and I think personal career. Um, I'm trying to get a little human here. What co what human cost? And what is it? What what has your efforts cost you personally? I mean, I want to be very not honest. necessarily financially, but emotionally. I want to be very honest and say I've been very lucky in my life, and I've I've had tremendous support from my parents, from my family, and but I can tell you that when you step out on a limb, you do get a lot of shit. I mean, <laughs> since the campaign started. Uh, we have a wall and a folder with the death threats in it. We have another one with the insults. We have another one with the jokes, the cracks, right? I mean, we read them all, we see everything, and we put it somewhere and, and hold on to it because you need something to motivate you. <laughs> you need something to carry you forward. And the other side of that is that when you are willing to do what's right and tell the truth, a lot of people are going to get really mad at you about it. And a lot of people in the press and in the media are going to come after you. There's going to be nasty stories. They're going to say nasty things. But lies decay and the truth persists. Yeah, I think that's a very important lesson from Mike's life too because a lot of lies were told about him. And a lot of lies still are told about him, but most of them have faded with time. And what remains is what he did. And honestly, the other side of this, and again, talking about costs, I think what you have to be willing to do is say, how I turn out, how I end up, where I go, is not what this is about. I mean, where we're going is about all of us. And whatever role we play in that, it's like cells in the body. You know, we have our role to play, and that's what comes first and foremost, I think. But I also want to be very honest and say that we've been very lucky and that those costs have a lot to do with being rejected by a political establishment, which I don't think we wanted to be a part of anyway in the first place. I can tell you I got yelled at by Tom Perez. I can tell you that we got some nasty calls from John Delaney's chief of staff. I can tell you that... We're not getting any jobs in the Biden administration. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's the first part of it, but that stuff doesn't matter, really. I mean, that's not what it's really about. Um, and then, uh, let's see. What, what roles do you see for distributed technologies introduced at South by Southwest over the years, like Twitter, cryptocurrencies, NFT, DAO, and so on? I think that's how you put it. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to get out in front and say I'm a bit of a skeptic, but I understand why people come to this stuff, and I understand why it's really inspirational to people, because they want to imagine an economy and a society that's structured differently, one in which people have what they need to live well, that we're connected to each other in a way that we're not connected by our current system, that money could be something that... Uh, it brings us together, I guess, rather than separating us and ranking us. I think the danger is because people are making so much money, because there's such a gold rush going on that a lot of those things get distracted from. I mean, I do think that technology in, in the future, we're all going to live differently and be impacted by it. But again, it's, 
It's about the human element that lies underneath all of that. If it succeeds at bringing you together with other people, it's, if it succeeds at making new connections and building new communities, then that's great. And I think you hold on to that. But you have to be very careful because there's a great line out there. Everything starts as a movement, uh, decays into a business, and then eventually becomes a grift. And I think that's something you have to keep in mind. It can start with really good purposes and motives and very quickly decay into a scheme to make money. And so anyway, I think that's something you have to be wary of and careful of, uh, you know, and on the watch for, especially when people are trying to sell you something. Absolutely. I think Henry's answer to this question is great. We have to try to understand why people are being attracted to these alternatives in the first place. But I would be remiss if I didn't say here at South by Southwest, which has been plastered with sponsorships from blockchain businesses, from NFT businesses, from Bitcoin folks, from cryptocurrencies, that I think most of it's a scam. Um, most, of it was? most of it's a scam. <laughs> most of it's a, a speculative asset that uh, is being sold to you. <laughs> uh, perhaps you're engaging in it for good reason, like Henry said, but I think most of it's a scam. And if you want to learn more about it, the Gravel Institute has a YouTube video. We do have a video about it. That you can, you can go more. watch if, if you're interested. You know, it's interesting. Both of you, because we stood there and had our picture taken in front of that stuff. And I was thinking, oh. <laughs> Is that your father's voice? He's huh? back there. Your father's voice speaking to you and Mike's voice speaking to us and saying, you got to stay honest. Well, that's the hard part. I think we're out of time. Yeah, but I want to uh, end on a different note and just say that that's not what it's about, ultimately. It's about hope. It's about love. And it's also about connecting yourself to something that really matters. And if you're connected to that, what you do... The means you use, I mean, so long as they are achieving that end, that's, I think, what really matters. I think it, what it's about is human suffering. And sometimes the human suffering is just whoever's right in front of you who is bleeding in their own way and needs your help. And it's about a very deep, we need to be very mature right now, very reflective, really think deeply about the times in which we live. And I think the deeper your questioning, the deeper your inquiry, the deeper the level of answers that will move through you. And I think whether it has to do with Ukraine, whether it has to do with COVID, whether it has to do with environmental breakdown, or whether it has to do with the state of our democracy, whether it has to do with the rise of the alt-right, um, it's a very sobering time. And one of the things we were talking about earlier today is if you're not depressed, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Sometimes the fact that you're very sad about something is a sign of mental health. It's not a mental dysfunction to be very concerned at a time such as this. And I think we have allowed our culture to infantilize us. Too many men have behaved like little boys, too many women have behaved like little girls. And I think we should coddle within ourselves and in each other the remnants of kind of ditziness and learned powerlessness that the society has fostered within us. And I think at that point, you're not trying to really change the world, you're trying to change yourself. And once we deepen and we make contact with the nobility and dignity intelligence that's already within us, then I think new energies, new intelligence, new thought forms, new possibilities will emerge. And I think it will affect the entire world. Mm -hmm. on, that, on that beautiful note, uh, we're going to wrap it up. If, if you've enjoyed the conversation, uh, I'd encourage you to check out uh, Marianne Substack, uh, the, the Gravel Institute, um, my documentary, American Gadfly, which is available now. And, and then you can learn more about Mike there as well. Um, and thank you all for being here. Have a great festival. Woo!